37 years ago, Kerr McGee shut down the uranium and plutonium processing facility near Crescent. Parts of the 840-acre site are still contaminated as plans are moving forward to begin selling off parcels of the large complex. The final cleanup will continue as the legacy of the facility still haunts those who remember what happened there in the early 1970s. This is what is left of the Cimarron nuclear fuels plant. The large cement slab is where the uranium processing facility used to be. In this building, Kermagee experimented with a coal gasification project, which failed. The company walked away from the project, leaving all the equipment sitting in the place it remains today. Then there's this building, the one that drew most of the attention at this former nuclear fuel processing facility. It's the old plutonium processing building where Karen Silkwood worked. Because of repeated vandalisms, the entry to the building is welded shut, but it and what's left of the old uranium processing site are no longer contaminated. In fact, there are buyers for the property waiting to move in. Of the three sections of land now deemed usable, one was not polluted with uranium, thorium, nitrates, or fluorides, and has been used for agriculture purposes for some time. Another piece of property across Highway 74 has also been cleared for unrestricted use. In all, the three pieces of property are appraised at just under half a million dollars. I'd like to explain what unrestricted use means. That means that from the radiological exposure concept, not from nitrates or fluorides, but from uranium dose, there is no restriction on how that property would be used. Jeff Lux is the project manager for the public trust that is charged with cleaning up the mess that Kermagee left behind. The site is owned by a trust that was created by the Justice Department as part of the bankruptcy filing by Tronox, the company that ended up with the chemical division of the former Kermagee Corporation. With $10 million from Tronox, Lux and his environmental property management company are working on getting rid of the remaining pollution, which is in the groundwater. To get to the locations of the worst pollution, you have to take a slow, long drive down a winding, bumpy back road across a small lake that no one has fished for decades to an area not far from the Cimarron River. That's where Kermagee buried barrels of uranium-contaminated material. Also buried here, acids used in the process that left behind nitrates and fluorides in excess and thorium from the defunct Kermagee refinery in Cushing. Thorium isn't soluble, so it was disposed of when the barrels of uranium polluted sludge and dirt were dug up and taken off site. So now Jeff Lux has three pollution problems remaining. At a town hall meeting in Crescent, a handful of people showed up to see just how he proposes to finally clean it all up. We're going to attack this in two phases. Because we have limited funding and we don't know if we can get the entire site cleaned up with the money that's there, Let's first of all focus on the uranium. It was obvious from the questions those in the audience were asking that they are still concerned about the radiation the site contains. Your emphasis is on site, and my concern is downstream, as you can well understand. So I don't want any unintended costs spilled over, you know, from the site. Patty Hazelwood is now a city councilwoman in Guthrie. She has lived in the area for decades. What is this, 2012, and we're just now finding out how bad it really is? The former Kerr-McGee plant was home to three burial sites where radioactive material was dumped. There was a pond up on that, right on the hill there. Yeah. There was a big impoundment up there, and that impoundment ah. had, uh, is where they pumped wastewater to. Right. And they process the uranium with nitric acid. In earlier decommissioning work, the trenches were reopened, the radioactive barrels and dirt removed and disposed of. One of those trenches was right next to a slough, or drainage ditch. There were some trenches running north-south along here that uh, material had been buried in. They've been excavated. Groundwater is moving from here that way into the drainage ditch. Monitoring wells are on either side of the old trenches to watch for what is still showing up in the groundwater. So the uranium in the groundwater has migrated out here and it curves off that way down to the low spot. And 
and then it heads out from there north to the north. river. Yeah, so on either side, it's pretty okay, but right here in this little dip, there's just a real long, uh, narrow plume that heads plume. way out there. The plan is to pump out the worst of the uranium contaminated water, clean it, and then use it to get rid of the remaining nitrates and fluorides. The clean water that comes out of that treatment system, we would pump over here and we would inject it into the, into the sandstone to push the uranium that's in this little area out where it would flow down here into the alluvium and be picked up by those wells. Some of that cleaned up water will also be pooled on site and mixed with water that contains low levels of uranium. Once deemed diluted enough, that will be pumped into the Cimarron River. The state can't allow us to create a greater risk discharging to the river than we currently have on the site. If the trust can stretch its money far enough to ever reach the point of full decommissioning, it will likely be a decade from now. Then we monitor for two years, once a quarter for two years, so that we get seasonal variations. And the reason we're doing that monitoring is to make sure that we don't have rebound as, as you quit moving water through there and let it sit will more uranium or nitrate come off the soils into the groundwater, so we monitor for that. The defunct Kermigee Cimarron nuclear fuel processing facility has sat dormant for nearly four decades because of all the radiation and contamination. 38 years after a young woman first brought attention to the plant, raising issues of contamination, safety, and missing bomb-grade plutonium. Her name did not come up during the town hall meeting, but you could almost sense her presence. Karen Silkwood died in November of 1974 in a car wreck that was officially listed as an accident. Patty Hazelwood remembers it all very well. And there were people that died from that plant that handled that stuff. They didn't have the security and the, the safety regulations that they should have had because this was the first time this had been done. And let's face it, Logan County, we're up here in the middle of nowhere, and they paid money to people that they couldn't make those kind of jobs in Guthrie. They flocked out here. Hazelwood says it's good to see the effort now to clean up the environmental mess. She just hopes everyone has learned a lesson. And I appreciate having the NRC here and uh, Jeff from the environmental people and the DEQ. I mean, this is wonderful that we have this now, and, and this should keep this from ever happening again. But the fact that it did, we can't go back and undo and give Karen Silkwood's children their mother back. I just would like to see the truth of it come out. But there remains one thing the decommissioning process and the years have not wiped clean. The ongoing mystery of what happened to Karen Silkwood and what happened to all that missing plutonium. Bob Sands produced this story. Bob, your report indicated that some of this polluted water would be used for irrigation. How is that safe? Well, that's a good question, and that's one of the reasons they have all these monitoring wells on the site. The, the water that they're going to use for irrigation, uh, it would, can, according to them, would be very low-level uranium water. They'll monitor it. They'll, you know, it'll get captured by these wells. They'll be able to see what's going on, according to Jeff Lux, and, uh, you know, be able to take new steps to do remediation if problems redevelop. That's one of the reasons they have all these monitoring wells. How much money does this public trust have to clean up the site? Well, that's a big issue because they started off with 10 mil. They got about 6 million left, and that's not enough. Uh, that's all Tronox money. They're hoping they can get some more money through the sale of this property. That's one of the reasons they want to sell it. Uh, the point is it costs them a million dollars, them being the trust, a million dollars a year just to maintain the site because of the licenses and all the other things associated with it doesn't even count the cleanup or decommissioning effort. So it may or may not be enough money to actually do the job right. Bob Sands, thanks for that report. Thank you.